channel and welcome to Newton by the Sea up in Northumberland. It's Friday, it's 20 past 7, I've got the day off work and there's nobody around. Ideal. So what we're doing, we're on the chase for a Northumberland codlin or ras. I've already got the first bait out. I'm just preparing my second rig here. Got a big, big tide today. Low water is about quarter past nine, it's about a 0.7 ebb. Water's absolutely gin clear. Sea's really flat, which is exactly the kind of conditions you want for summer cod fishing. So I'm just gonna creep down onto that, onto the little area there known as Miller's. Fire one out into the bay hopefully come up with the goods. It's the 19th of May, so it's, it's right at the beginning. You, you, do, you do get fish this time of year, but this year, to be fair, has been pretty cold in April. Although that said, there are a lot of, a lot of turns flying around over my head here. I can see they've got sand eels in their beaks, and I know that the mackerel are starting to show a little bit further down the coast off Tyneside, so Things are starting to warm up a little bit, so you never know. I don't think the crab molt have started up here yet, which is obviously a big, the main catalyst for a lot of fish being drawn in closer to the shorts. Been getting, obviously, as you can see, been getting crab down to Tyneside, but it's always a little bit later up here with the water just being that little bit cooler. It's probably, I don't know, maybe 10 degrees-ish, something like that, 10, 11. So, don't think the crabs will have started to come on up here just yet, but you never know. You can you can get fish this time of year. So I'm just gonna get a nice big juicy crab bait on. So now we've got a lovely decent sized peeler ready to go on. And what I'm gonna do, I'd ordinarily add half a crab like that and bind half the legs and a claw to it and get two baits out of it, but I'm mad keen to get a fish, so and I've got I've got a decent supply in there. I must have about 12 or 13 decent sized crabs, so I'll have more than enough for the session. I'm going to be fishing about four hours. So the way I like to do it is put the hook through the end, through the, the sort of bottom end, then out above the head, like that. Just pull it over the knot, touch. Get your elastic, bind it on like that. And once you put the hook through it and back out, it just lays nicely along the hook shank and you can just, it lies straight and you can just bind it up and get a fairly streamlined bait out of that. I try to keep my baits as straight as I can because what that does is it stops them from spinning in the air when you cast them. Sometimes they do spin, there's nothing you can do about it, but the straighter you can keep your bait, the more chance, well, the less chance you've got of it spinning in the air, so. 4 row Aberdeen Mustard, Ultra Sharp Viking on the bottom. And something I don't usually do for these marks, but 
I'm going to give it a shot. I've got a, a smaller three o, again, ultra sharp mustard worm hook on the top. And I'm just going to nick that in, two, three. A, so it acts as a bit of a bait stop, and B, it just gives you that second chance. So that's a perfect crab bait. These hooks will, I've said it so many times before, they're strong enough to pull a fish in, but if you do get a fast hold and you're using decent quality braid, you can bend them out. So you kind of get the best of both worlds. You minimize your tackle losses and obviously you minimize the amount of snags you're putting out there, because this is quite a popular venue. It'll get fished a lot. So you don't want to get the place snagged up. Rig-wise, usual pulley. I like to use a longer pulley, I've said on previous videos, so I've got more thicker mono in the water against the rocks and the kelp rather than braid, which is a lot more prone to getting nicked and snapping. Little rotter, I like to get my pliers and just close the gap a little bit. I like to tie the knot to the side and to the side of the sinker. Why do I do that? So it just sits nicely and there's no knot in the way of anything. Well, to get myself out onto that next bit of rock over there, that's been out probably 10, 15 minutes. Fire on out and hopefully come back to you with a fish. Right, tide's dropped a bit. Kind of closer to the mark that I prefer to be on. So I've got some pots to me left here. So the first cast, I'm just going to get straight out into the bay. Line. Watch your footing on these places because the weed can be very slippy. I always like to keep my rod tip nice and high. It's not too bad at the minute, but the next hour or so. The heavier kelp, which stays under the, which starts starts to come out towards the bottom of the tide, that'll show for about the first 15, 20 yards out here. So you want your rod tip above it. So if you get a fish you're in contact with it, you don't want to be battling on with the kelp if it's slopped over your line or anything. But I have to say, conditions here look absolutely perfect. Gin clear water. Sea's totally flat, lovely big juicy fresh crab bait out there, so let's see if we can get the first, first kelpie of the year. When you're fishing marks like this, especially if you're using braid like I am today, probably only fishing into maybe five, six foot of water max I would say. So the bites are absolutely savage, even from small fish. And if you get a better fish, you definitely know about it. But I'll tell you what though, what an absolutely superb morning for it. Would you know what I meant if I said, you know, sort of beginning of the week, midweek, you sat at work or stood at work, whatever you, whatever you do for a living, and you're kind of planning your session out in your head for the weekend and you're picturing in your mind's eye what it's going to be like. Well, I can safely say this is exactly what I was picturing in my mind's eye. It's flat, nobody around, gin clear, barely a breath of wind. Absolutely perfect. Just had the first decent bite there. Whoop, there we go. Oh yeah, something having a good go at that. Yep, fish on. Oh, doesn't actually doesn't actually feel a bad one. This. Got to try and keep it moving through that kelp. It's really, really going for it. On, keep moving. Yep. This is why you've got to have a rod that's got plenty of backbone because these fish will just keep diving. 
diving into that kelp. Come on. Putting up a good account of itself, this fella. You can feel every strand of kelp that it's swimming through. I've got them up, got them up on the surface there now. Oh, oh, oh. Yes, get in. Second chuck, first, first Kelpie of the year. And what an absolutely beautiful one it is too. Look at that. He's absolutely wolfed that bait down. Look at that for a summer Kelpie. Whoop. And look at that for a broken leg as well, Nelly. Beautiful. First thing in the morning. Nice fish, probably two and a quarter, two and a half, something like that. Well, what about that for a start? First proper kelpie of the summer. Get in. Took a nice big juicy crab here. Let's get let's get another one out. probably seen on the rigs that I'm using, I'm using plain sinkers, not grippers. My personal view is the slide through the kelp and through this, these sorts of rocks a lot easier. I don't know if you can see here, it's just these rocks are covered in like fairly soft, it's almost mud and you've got the thicker kind of kelp, more jungly stuff than a lot of this longer kind of, I don't know what it's called. The point being out there it's so th dense, the kelp. There aren't that many kind of sharp barnacly bits. You tend to get the sharper barnacle rocks further up the shoreline. So I personally think the, the sinker slides through the kelp a bit easier. If you've got a gripper, especially if they're heavy gauge wires and they're quite tight, it can just create more, more problems than, than benefits in my view. One, one small thing, and I th it is a small thing with a plain sinker. You do have to keep an eye on your braid. You do have to just keep, not, re not keeping your gear tight, because obviously you'll pull into a snag, but you've just got to keep taking up that slack, because as the sinker just sort of slowly sits down and finds its place, it can have a tendency just to move a little bit. But for me personally, I've, I'm more of a plain sinker man for this sort of fishing. Right, third cast in, Let's see what we can do. What I'm actually doing with these baits, <clears throat> unlike a lot of you know worm baits or anything like that, with crab, if there's anything left on, I just give it a squeeze and just lash another one to the side of it. Works a treat. You can just bulk your bait up because fishing like this, it's not about it's not about distance casting. You just want a nice big lump of bait sat in the seabed, so it just attracts whatever's whatever's out there. And that first bait was fresh, you know, 15, 20 minutes ago, so there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. So I just like to get my next crab and just lash it on the side and just have a nice big scenty bait for those cod and wrasse to find. But, got to say, very, very happy with that. Very happy indeed. What I will do over the course of this session, I've cast roughly in the same place as I had that first fish. But what I'll do, if this cast doesn't produce anything, I'll just start fan casting the different distances. Sometimes the fish in these venues can literally be under your feet 20, 30 yards away. They just sit resident in the kelp and they'll just sniff about wherever the food is, whether or not it's 100 yards out or 20 yards out, it really, really doesn't matter.
So it always pays to not get caught up and just wanting to blast it out of the horizon. Just dot your baits around, find the fish. Because if they're resident fish, they'll just mooch around. And it's just about finding them. And obviously putting decent sized, good quality bait out so they can find you, find your bait as well. And as you can see, by the way that first fish, well, I say first like I'm expecting more, by the way that fish took the bait, they're obviously hungry because there was, there was no doubt he was on. The rod was just going crazy and he just wolfed it down. So it's a good sign. Personally, for a lot of these Northumberland Rock End venues, especially on the bigger tides where you lose a lot of water quickly, I do like to get down quite early on before low water. I mean, I was down here probably roughly three hours before low water. I'm just gonna keep him cool out the sun there before I fill it in later. Because I just think any fish that have moved in at high tide and that might still be hanging around, I mean, some of the ones further out will just sit sit resident in the kelp but any ones that are kind of coming in and out you've just got that bit more chance of catching them with a bit more depth I think so always like to try and get down and get out there as soon as you can because as I said earlier sometimes not always but sometimes when the water drops to the bottom of the tide especially on a big spring like today it can quieten off a little bit so quite often you find you get get your fish on the ebb not all the time, because, as I say, when the fish are resident, the tenter, you know, the tenter just be there and feed. But definitely ebb or a bit of the floods. But a slack can be a bit, be a bit quiet, like like most fishing really. So I think I've mentioned a couple of times, <clears throat> in terms of your rotten bottom link. I just like to get a length of forty pound amnesia tie a couple of overhand knots in and that just weakens it so it probably takes it down to I don't know 20 something like that and it just means you've got a little bit of a chance of getting your sinker but if it is hard fast and you've got a fish on it'll just pull out and you get your gear and the fish back <laughs> Absolutely crack, and I'm just looking on the beach here at Newton, and I can see one person. I can guarantee you, in a couple of months' time, that will not be the case. Let's get this one a touch further out to the left. I hit it a bit further, just with the water not being as deep at the moment, because because uh, we're on the bottom of the tide. So let's see what we can do. Right. 
important to make sure your feet, you've got a good platform under you when you're about to wind in. Tell from having the drone up, there's just fringes of weed and rock, but there are patches of sand as well. And I think sometimes what might happen is if you if your gear ends up on a patch of sand, you've got less chance of getting a fish because I'm not sure how confident they'll feel swimming out onto the open sand in broad daylight. I mean, that's, that has literally not been touched. Probably got about another, another hour of fishing, I'd say. And then I'm gonna have to make tracks because I'm actually away at the Lake District this weekend for my old man's 70th. So very much looking forward to that. And this has been a bit of a treat really to start the weekend. Got a day off work, managed to get a fish and it's absolutely glorious. Quarter past 10 now, we're probably 45 minutes an hour into the flood. And I'm gonna put this next cast a little bit further left again. And the reason for that is, my theory, tide's starting to flood now. You don't get any noticeable tide pull on these venues, but it is flooding, so it is going from east to west, left to right. So what I'm thinking is, if I put a big bait up there, all the particles, if you've ever washed your hands after you've been baiting up a crab, you can see how much scent it lets off. All of the particles will come into the bay here. So the idea being any fish that are in here will find them and swim up. Whereas if I cast to the right now, closer to the beach, I think, and the sand starts going towards the beach, I don't think there'll be as many fish, if any at all, that, that far down. So I think I can cover a bigger area by sticking my bait up there, hopefully cover this deeper part, and any fish that are on here, will pick it up on the tide, swim up and find it. That's the theory. Uh, yeah, yeah, you need to be low, low tide, definitely. Oh, yeah. Whoa. Oh, there is, yeah, it's rough. Oh, don't miss, come on. It can be, yep. Very heavy going, as you can see, but... Another nice kelpie. So there we are, kelpie number two, another lovely, lovely marked fish. Been living in the kelp for a while. It's just taken that crab again, absolutely demolished it. Just the tide start to flood, so pleased with that. Might sneak one more cast. Well, I've got to admit, I was beginning to think it wasn't going to happen. I had that first fish early doors, and then that was that was probably about nearly three hours ago. As soon as that tide's flooded, chuck it a bit further to the left, a couple of really nice bangs, fish on. So that's the second fish 
he's probably, I don't know, two and three quarters. He's a little bit bigger than the first one. He took the hooks right down, so he wasn't going back, unfortunately, but he'll certainly not go to waste. And I can feel in his belly, he's absolutely loaded with maybe crabs or squat lobsters or something like that. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna open him up. I did just see something fall out of his mouth there. I think it was a little squat lobster. I'm gonna open him up and see what he's got inside of him, but yeah. Really, really happy with that. Let's have a look and just see what he's been feeding on. You can see straight away his stomach is absolutely loaded, so. Lovely gruesome job for a Friday morning, isn't it? But it's all in the name of science. There's a free meal for a lobster or a seagull there. So let's see what he's been feasting on. Little edible crab. Little male edible crab. He's just, you can just see how greedy cod are, can't you? They just wolf it down. You must have some serious stomach acids. Just breaks that down and turns it into a cloud of goodness at the other end. And we've also got, as I suspected, tiny, tiny little squat lobster. Hopefully you can see that. Isn't that amazing? Oops, and we've also got one final treat who's slightly further on the digestion process. Another little edible crab. So this one, compared to the last one, has had a very good feed. But unfortunately, that was the end for him. Right, last one. Nearly lost me foot in there. Serves us right, I was stood on that, I should have really kicked it out the way. These little areas here give you an idea of how quickly the tide comes in on these big spring tides in these areas. So if you are, if you're not from, if you're not familiar with fishing these sorts of venues, that is what you have to watch out for because that's just literally like somebody turned a tap on. You can see it's like a stream. It's absolutely flying in, so you've got to have your wits about it. It's very, very easy to get cut off. So as beautiful as it is in this environment, safety is paramount. Well, that's the end of the session. It's nearly 11 o'clock. Tide's really starting to scream in now. It's coming in through all the nooks and crannies and little gullies around us, so I'm going to have to get off here fairly sharpish. But... It's been an absolutely cracking morning. Great way to start off the summer cod season. I've had a couple of fish, nice eaters. Would have gone back had they been lip hook, they weren't, but they'll certainly not go to waste. So I'm really, really pleased about that. So yeah, it's been a fantastic morning. Weather's been really, really kind. Perfect conditions, flat seas, gin clear water, big tide, ideal. So hopefully you've enjoyed watching. Hopefully you've seen a little bit of Newton by the Sea in Northumberland cracking place to fish so anyway thanks for watching do leave a comment give it a thumbs up subscribe if you haven't already it is appreciated tight lines keep fishing we'll see you on the next one